Welcome to my podcast, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality. My name is Vicki Poole. I'm a life coach, health coach, and hypnotist at the Enlightened Peach. And this podcast is all about embracing our mosaic life. And some of you may ask, what is a mosaic life? Well, it's recognizing that all the pieces of our life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, have all come together to make us who we are. Change any one thing and we are different. With that in mind, I invite you to embrace your perceived imperfections and celebrate who you are. And this podcast is unedited and raw, just like life. And I will be your host, and I will have special guests from time to time. As a matter of fact, I have a really great guest today. I'm so excited to get to talk to her. If you have any ahas or questions, please leave a comment or a voice message. So now let's get started. And I've got Terry's bio here. So I am going to read this to you because I don't want to miss anything. Um, her name is Terry Chase. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Terry Chase began her early life exploring the wooded area of Long Island, New York. Her travels as a young girl to Reno, Nevada, spurred an interest in the mountains and desert plains. Terry has always been adventurous and loves the outdoors. She's passionate about teaching and has superpowers that help make hard and complicated concepts, ideas, and techniques easy to understand. And she always does it with a bit of fun. Terry brings the valuable life experience of living with spinal cord injury for over 30 years to her work helping others with creating a vision for the future and developing the practical steps to move forward. She is a highly educated individual with numerous degrees and certifications, most of which she attained after her spinal cord injury, which is amazing to me. Most notably, her doctorate of nursing. And there's so much about that that is just amazing as I read your book. Terry lives full out and is active in all things outdoors, including kayaking, cross-country skiing, hand cycling, and whenever possible, horseback riding. Terry, her partner Sharon, their two dogs, and a cat reside in western Colorado in the shadow of the Colorado National Monument. And ah, so thank you, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm super stoked. And, and I will say that I love Colorado myself. My daughter lived there for a while and I got to go and explore some, but um, beautiful. And the thing that amazed me about Colorado was the sky just seemed so immense. It's like, because, and when I got back to Georgia, which is where I live, I thought, well, no wonder we've got too many Friggin' trees, you know, <laughs> there's trees so tall and everything, yeah. but oh my gosh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So how long have you been in Colorado? I've lived in Colorado since 1976. So whatever okay. the math is on that. So, so, so for close, a bit. Yeah. So for a while. A bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you must like it. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> So if I'm remembering right, I know when you um, you you were ex exceptionally active and you biked and you did all these things that were just mentioned, you did all those things or a lot of those things prior to the accident, correct? That's true. And, and to be honest with you, my my um, my activity and the variety of things that I did expanded after my injury. So when I was hurt, I was a middle school PE teacher. So I was, you know, on my legs all day long. I refereed volleyball and basketball. I rode my bike. I played on soccer teams and softball teams and stuff like that. But yeah, so I was a very active person. Yeah, wonderful. And if you don't mind, I, I know I, it's been a it's been a while, so it probably sure. doesn't have as much of an emotional charge as it probably did a few years ago. But I would see think with what happened, it was still have that that feeling about it. Um, sure. But could you just share with us, I know you were on your bike when it happened. Can you just share with us, if you'd rather read it from your book? Um, no, no, I, I can tell you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. actually it was 35 years ago. Okay. <laughs> so it's been a while. So yeah. uh, yes, I mean, th there are still parts of it that are meaningful to me and still can evoke emotion at certain times. I mean, it's not like I bust out crying whenever I talk about my injury. Because um, it, well, what happened was uh, it was a sunny Saturday afternoon in April of 1988. I was riding my bike back into town from a, just a, a, I just was out on a 10 mile ride. No, no big deal. And as I was crossing one, one river bridge and getting ready to go into what I call my junkyard route um, and kind of peel off uh, onto another road, a man who was driving drunk was behind me and he hit me 
you know, I didn't know he was even there. All of a sudden I'm on the top of a of the hood of a vehicle and I knew this is really bad. I could hear my bike crunching underneath and it was very hot on the car. He swerved, I rolled, hit the ground and sustained a T12 burst fracture, which left me with partial paralysis. Okay. So um, I'm assuming he was charged and had to answer to this. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. He will eventually, well, he left the scene of the accident. So okay. there was uh, s several charges that were brought up against him, leaving the scene of the accident prior, prior DUI, no license, no insurance, um, not being, uh, not being documented in the country, you know, all that stuff. He did leave the scene of the accident and about six hours later, they found him. There was a neighborhood here by the river that noticed a guy was driving a car into the river and they thought that was a little odd. So they called the cops and the cops are like, that's the guy we're looking for. <laughs> so he so put he his, was, he, he put his car yeah. in the river thinking he, he wouldn't get caught? To, yeah, it was a, it was, it was a gigantic Lincoln Continental, you know, those long, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, ugly looking things. So anyway, so anyway, I'm always grateful to that neighborhood for spotting that and getting him caught. So yeah, yeah. he did some time and then was deported back to his home country okay so um i know uh you were in the hospital for quite a while with a broken back and then like you said partially paralyzed but weren't your legs completely paralyzed in the beginning and then um am yeah. i remembering right and then with the physical right. therapy and all you were able to get some yeah. feeling back yeah, yeah. So the way spinal cord injuries work, what I have was called a incomplete spinal cord injury. So my spinal cord was bruised. Um, it wasn't cut, uh, mm -hmm. but a bruise can be as bad as a cut because of the uh, damage to the spine and all of the nerves that are and there. The swelling so, and everything yeah. too, right? Yes, correct. The swelling in the spinal cord. So as over time, as that resolved and the nerves that weren't damaged were able to then be, you know, I, I could start using them. I did. So I do... I do walk some with uh, what we call AFOs, uh, short leg braces and crutches, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, which I'm very thankful for. And I can walk on airplanes and I can, you know, walk short distances and stuff like that. But after 35 years, I've got to be much more discerning about, you know, taking care of my shoulders and taking care of my body Yeah, because I want to do sports. I don't want to just walk around to show I can walk. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's great to walk, but don't get me wrong, but I'd rather, you know, go swimming and do kayaking and hand cycle than mm -hmm. just show off that I can walk. Yeah. That's how I feel. Yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah. So I know you were talking a lot about some of the, the care that you were given in the hospital and how mm -hmm. um, if... And, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong on some of this, because like I had said yeah. before we got started, it's been just a little bit since I read yeah. the book. But um, and thank you for sharing that with me, by the way. And we will mm -hmm. be putting a link in the comments for anybody that's interested in getting the book because it's very, very worthwhile to read. Um, but if I'm remembering right, you had some people that were really good about you not being able to do things. And then you had some other people that, as far as the caregivers, <clears throat> that were not really good about you not being able to do things or being in pain and those kinds of things. Am I am yeah. remembering correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I did. So, so my book is called Spoke by Spoke, How a Broken Back and a Broken Bike Led to a Wholehearted Life. And it's a series of stories of my experience of going through the last you know many years of spinal cord injury. In, and I wrote these stories in hopes that they would help others. Right. And not not in the sense of, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. Not that. Or right. here's a recipe. You want a successful yeah. life? Follow me. <laughs> it was more like I really wanted to use the examples of my life to help others. Right. Right. So there there are, I mean, so so my experience of being a patient is what led me to being a nurse. I know. That's kind of and what it, I was yeah. I was kind of alluding to. You had some people that were just yeah. amazing that inspired you to do this and then Right. other people that weren't so amazing and they inspired right. you to make a difference. Correct. I, is that right? Okay. That is correct. So that's a great way of saying it. So one of the things I was very intrigued with, and it started me on a 30 something year journey of what made me feel better mm -hmm. because there were times when I was with certain, you know, with, with healthcare providers and it was like, I just felt better. It had nothing to do with the medicine, the treatment, the therapy, the, this, the, that, whatever it was their presence. Right. And so I, even though at that time I wasn't quite sure what that was. So it took me, led me on a journey of several graduate degrees and experiences of what, what made me feel better. And each level of that learning for me was just another 
you know, level of my own learning and so on. And, and so what, one of the stories is called, she listened. And it was uh, after uh, another healthcare provider was somewhat dismissive and kind of rude to me. And I just collapsed. I mean, I just collapsed inside. I just was like, that's it. I'm done. I, I can't live like this. You know, that guy treated me like awful. And so a nurse came in and she's like, you know, you that's not you. What's going on? And I mean, it wasn't that quick. It took a little bit for her to get it out of me. But basically, I told her what happened and that she just listened. I mean, she just sat and listened. And then she said, OK, all right, well, let's let's get you out of your chair and get you into bed. And we've got fried chicken and mashed potatoes in the kitchen. I'll bring you some. So, you know, that that was that was a healing moment that was so impactful for me. That it was like, yes, that's, that's, that, I'm getting closer. That's what I want to do. I mm -hmm. want to be that healing presence for people. Yeah. And uh, I was, I was blown away with your um, determination to become a nurse because they said, you're in a wheelchair, you can't do this. Right. And, and you going right. through and reading about your experience <clears throat> with that and how you had to figure out how to maneuver different things that everybody else yeah. takes for granted. And, and I will share, I have a, I have a niece that has muscular dystrophy mm -hmm. and she's in a wheelchair and um, she's an adult, um, but she, you know, it's one of those progressive things. So it's, she's yeah. losing a lot all the time. She can't mm -hmm. do any of those wonderful sport things or anything like that. But um, it is, it's interesting with her when I get around her, a lot of times I'm reminded so much of the things that I take for granted every friggin' day. And yeah. so it's, it's like a wake up call, you know, I can roll over in the bed. I can get out of the bed. I can get frustrated because I have to go take care of an animal or I can get, you know, and there's so many things that, um, we, as people, I'm speaking for people who are, can, can walk and all that stuff that haven't had any of these medical issues that have that prevent that it is just um i don't know sometimes i don't even know how to articulate it but it in it's 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 so important as human beings to be more um mindful of these things with everybody mm -hmm. you sure. know um and so that's one of the things that really struck me you know with uh with you having to do so many things differently and figure it out and wrestle through it and not wanting to be, you know, well, we have to help her or anything like that. So you want to speak a little bit on that? Because I'm telling you, that was the most blown away I was. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I appreciate that. Well, um, I'll, I'll start with a couple of things. One is I was bound and determined from the beginning to make this situation work for me. Mm -hmm. Like I was not going to use, I'm not, I was not going to use the wheelchair as an excuse to stay stuck. Right. I saw it as an opportunity to go forward. I also know that knew that there was, there's a lot of um, what I might call like low expectations for people with disabilities. Like, Oh, oh well, yeah. disability, you're not going to be able to, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, right. no, I'm gonna go, I'm going to do everything. So I was very, I was very motivated to to get back. Well, first of all, I was very motivated to get back to my students at my middle school. I was a PE teacher at the time, and I'll tell this short story and then I'll move okay. into the other stuff. But um, basically, what it was was a month before I got hurt, one of our students completed suicide. Oh, and man. he was like the most handsome guy, quarterback, you know, most popular kid. And I'm like, no, oh, I can't leave my kids with this message of things get painful. Then you just, you know complete you, suicide i didn't yeah. want that it's like right. right bad things happen you get through it you come back and you you know you do better come on kids let's go so that was very motivating for me then the whole thing about going into nursing school was i didn't even think about what it would be like for a person in a wheelchair to go to <laughs> nursing school i'm like <laughs> yes. i'm just going to that program and i'm going to apply because it really spoke to me mm -hmm. it spoke to me it was based on the theory of human caring and anyone who's in nursing knows about jean watson and her theory of human caring and it's it came, it came really close to what I was looking for, what made me feel better. So I, you know, I just, in my chapter in my book is called Flinging Forward, because honestly, I just like, okay, I'm going to apply to nursing school. I didn't even think about it. I'm just going to go. And then they didn't accept me the first time. And I, I just came right back at them and said, you know, was it my disability? And they're like backpedaling. No, it's not your disability. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, then what was it? <laughs> so uh, without them really saying it, it was 
my disability. So anyway, right. so it right. was also probably my my application could have read better. You know, like something like I want to be a nurse. But, yeah. You know, anyway, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So I did get some. I did get some, um, some help with that, and I improved my I improved my essays and said yes, I want to be a nurse, and articulated what I was really feeling inside, which was. What made me feel better? I think it's this. Maybe it's that theory of human caring. I want to help people. So that's what it happened. And so then the experience of being a student was challenging because, you know, there's that big spotlight on me like, okay, you're in a wheelchair. Are you going to be able to do this? Okay. And, you know, I was not the weakest person in my class. I'll tell you that, even though I had half paralyzed legs. So I had to have a little discussion with the faculty about take the spotlight off me. You know, I will not be unsafe. I will ask for help. I will problem solve, but take that spotlight off me because that's not, that's not right. Yeah. And so they did. And uh, we got through it. But then, you know, there were nurses along the way as, as all nursing students experience, you know, kind of like nurses who don't really want to deal with students, but they're behind me saying things out loud, like, how could she ever be a nurse? She's in a wheelchair. And I'm like, well, they're kind of dumb because I can still hear what they're saying. <laughs> You know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yes. But anyway, um, but the end there were very there were very great faculty and very great clinical fact, you know, clinical um nurses who helped me. I never had one patient say, get her out of here, she's in a wheelchair. Not once. They were like, yeah. I saw them eye to eye. I could be, I could understand where they were at in their place by just my own experience. So mm -hmm. so there were a lot of positives, and I'm always very, very grateful for that. So are you still practicing nursing today? Well, I'm. Uh, I just retired from my last brick and mortar job. I was a, a BSN faculty, a, B, a faculty member in the BSN program mm -hmm. at a university here in Western Colorado. I just retired from that. Now I'm moving into my own work, which is consulting, coaching, and speaking. Okay, very cool, very cool. So, what really I know, um, as you were going through all these processes and learning these things, um, um. Tell me how you kind of got into the horse therapy. Okay, sure. Well, that was, so basically what I do is I I, I incorporate horses in the work that I do with people. And I do mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, facilitating uh, personal growth, spiritual growth, that kind of stuff. So incorporating horses into that work, uh, it's a field called equine facilitated or equine assisted learning. Mm -hmm. So I, it was part of my journey of what made me feel better. And it was, it, you know, through some other things, moved me into a training program of uh, doing equine assisted psychotherapy, where we learned to work with the horses. We learned to work with people um, from a psychotherapeutic standpoint, which at the time I was a psychotherapist. And I was like, you know what, that's really great, but not everybody wants to do therapy. And it's kind of freaky to say therapy. So so we, I moved, I, I disengaged from being a therapist and moved more into my coaching mm -hmm. and facilitation role. And I do that. So I had a lot of experiences in my own training about working with horses, about how they're just very present. They're, you know, they, they really want to be in a relationship. They're also very keen on nonverbal cues, um, you know, nonverbal language. And I think they really helped me be a better human being. So I run mini retreats and sessions with people and horses and uh, for growth and learning, we do, you know, we work on communication, safety, confidence, leadership, problem solving, how to get along better, all yeah. in partnership with the horses. So um, I've never done that kind of therapy before, so I'm really, really intrigued. So can you kind of tell us a little bit about um, what that looks like. I mean, sure. other than just somebody just there in front of the horse, I mean, yeah. and what kind of people benefit the most from that kind of thing? Sure. Well, when you're using the word therapy, that that's not what I do, but I can tell you a little bit about that. And what that is, is it requires a licensed mental health provider, whether that be an LPC or a licensed counselor or whatever. They work in partnership with a horse and, a, and someone who helps handle the horse and they work with the client on processing some things that might be going on with them. So uh, they might act, but they do hands-on work. So we work on, you know, grooming, leading, walking through ability courses, uh, taking them up and over uh, obstacle courses and that sort of thing with the purpose of delving into their psychiatric or mental health issue. Uh -huh. That's fine. What I do is I do hands-on, we do grooming, leading, going through obstacle courses, our ability courses to learn about ourselves. And so, you know, it's not just, hey, go out there and hang out with the horse. Although, you know, there are some programs that do that. 
Mm -hmm. um, but my, I have a little bitty plan that we work on and we just kind of work with the intention of uh, maybe it's communication, maybe it's safety. But the, the other thing that's really cool, Vicki, about working with horses that I've found is I might have this little bitty plan, but then there's all these really cool things that come from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I see patients, I see clients that I see healthcare providers that I do mini retreats for go, oh my God, I had, I was having so much trouble with thinking that this, whatever, whatever in my life was so big and bad and I can't do it. And me and the horse, we just walked right through it. We just went through some sort of metaphorical or some sort of symbolic thing. And they, and I, and they, and they learned that, you know, when they set an intention, when they look forward, you know, because you can't lead a horse by looking at the horse, mm -hmm. which a lot of people do. They look at the, okay, we're going to go forward. And the horse looks back at him and says, where's forward? So yeah. what we do is we look forward. We go that, you know, we're going to go forward. So we have a very respectful, caring way that we work with the horses. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that have happened in the work that I've done. Yeah. And I know you can't really share particulars about people, but what would you say that doing this um, with the, what it, you don't call it therapy, what do you call it? Well, I, I call it Aquinas, Aquinas assisted learning. Okay. So when you're doing that with uh, your clients and yep. so what is the, like the census afterwards of different people and everything about what kind of things it, other than what you just mentioned that it actually changed in them? Sure. Well, um, I, I can, I can talk about some of the okay. work I've done. This is not therapy. Um, so I, I recently worked with a team of healthcare providers who work in a very high level state level agency policy, you know, but they, they work on programs that are very meaningful to the, uh, that's, I think it was with children. So this group, the group of six, uh, hadn't met together live in person for two years because of COVID. So then they sign up to, to work with me because they wanted to work with, you know, like getting back together as a team, you know, seeing each other, you know, individually, you know, as, as human beings, and that kind of stuff. So we, we did our, our, our little, our work and, and, um, you know, I had them do things like the grooming, uh, like just standing with the horse and breathing, being really present, you know, getting back in their body. So we did that. And then I had them each individually lead the horse around the ability course and the obstacles. And then I had them work together, like, okay, grab somebody in your team. You two have to work. To, one person's going to be blindfolded now, you know, or have their eyes closed. And then, and then at the end of all that, they had their first live team meeting in the middle of the arena with all the horses. Oh, wow. And, I'm, and I, and I couldn't get to them because of the setup. I couldn't be out in the dirt with them, but I'm watching them going, wow, that looks really cool. And then they all came, I said, okay, come over here and tell me what's going on. Well, we just had our first live in-person meeting. And I'm like, oh my God, how how cool is that? And how did it go? Oh, it's great. We're, you know, too bad we can't bring the horses every time we want to have a meeting, but we just <laughs> feel so much better about ourselves. They 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 wake up, they feel more enlivened. Um, they're breathing, they're back in their bodies, they're clear-headed. So that does that give you some idea? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. So I'm uh, I'm assuming that um, we'll be having a link or something for people yes. to be able to sign up for something like that because that does sound amazing. Um, and so you're in Colorado, and that's where you primarily do all this, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so. Um, Maybe if you could, I know you'd mentioned something about reading something from the book. So is there a favorite passage or a favorite story that you would want to read and share? Well, they're all favorites. Um, <laughs> it's like your children, right? You have yeah, a whole bunch of children. They're, they're, they're all your favorites. Children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, suppose, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, they're all my favorites. Right? Is that what all parents do? Um, well, do you want, because you, you are an intuitive and you work with people in hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to read a story called A Plain White Garment. That's fine. And, yeah. And that's, uh, I don't know if you remember that, but that was, um, that to me has a lot of uh, spirituality in it. Uh, and let me see how many pages. So A Plain White Garment. Let me just make sure it's not too long. Yeah, that should be okay. Okay. So this is called uh, a plain white garment. You want to show them your your book before you start reading? Sure. I don't know if you can um, see it very well. There's a glare. Oh, okay. There we go. Spoke by spoke. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
Okay, so a plain white garment, chapter five. Saturday, late afternoon. I'm sitting in a wheelchair in my rehab hospital room. I've just returned from an outing to the shopping mall. This wheelchair and I are getting to know each other a little better. Recreation therapy outings are designed to help patients new to spinal cord injuries and wheelchairs navigate the world again. Malls aren't my usual environment for weekend adventures, but I'd sign up for anything to get out of the hospital. On this particular outing, I'd roll along the smooth, wide mall hallways and maneuvered through racks of summer dresses and stacks of pack packaged underwear. At the food court, I'd purchase a soda and a hot dog, passing the test of handling myself, my money and the wheelchair under the watchful eye of a recreation therapist. Now the day is done and it's time to make the transfer to my hospital bed. I still require the supervision of a nursing orderly to ensure I get from wheelchair to bed without ending up on the floor. I press the call button and politely say to the ward clerk on the other end of the speaker, okay, I'm ready for a transfer. Can you send in an orderly, please? I'm a compliant rehab patient for the most part, yet there are some rules I break on purpose. For example, I won't sign back into the patient logbook when returning from an out-of-hospital experience. It's my little, little bit of rebellion as a grown woman under the supervision of hospital workers. I wait for the orderly. I've come to know that workers don't always respond all that fast. There are many other patients and potential interruptions on their way to my room. So I get used to waiting, and that's what I do now. I sit and wait, and I wait some more. A light knock on the door gets my attention. This is a bit unusual. The orderlies usually just bust in without much warning, so I'm surprised someone is bothering to knock. Come on in, I'm decent, I say with a wry smile on my face. My modesty long since tempered from having been in the hospital for a couple of months. Oh, hi, the words come from a small statured gray haired woman I'd never seen before. She's very nondescript and plain looking, and she walks slowly and softly into my room, almost as if she's tiptoeing. Something is different about her. I can't recall having seen her before. I am. She gives me a name I don't recognize and which I still can't remember. Oh, uh, hello, I say. How can I help you? This seems like a reasonable response to a situation that feels slightly odd. Maybe she's lost or looking for my roommate. She holds a white shirt in her arms, apparently offering it to me. I sit still, wondering exactly what is happening. All my clothes are neatly stacked in the hospital room closet. Nothing is missing as far as I know. Certainly not this white shirt. You have been blessed by this circumstance, she says in a way I can only describe as a soft, loving voice. There are many great things ahead if you're willing to accept the blessings. I have brought you a garment, a symbol of this new life for you. This feels rather strange. I'm Catholic educated and a regular participant in mass, so I can appreciate the mystical in the world even ideas about spirits and unseen influences. I'm not even afraid of or weirded out by her comment. In fact, I feel fully present in this moment of exchange, so much so that it feels charged with something otherworldly. She stands still, extending the garment to me. I sit there silently, not knowing what to do. Should I hit that buzzer again? Should I be afraid even though I don't feel it? I don't know this lady, and I want to believe I don't have any idea what she's talking about. Yet on another level, I'm listening intently, as if understanding something on some other level than what I'm aware of. The shirt she's holding out to me is a thigh length pullover, a few buttons, no zippers. It doesn't bear any store tags or labels. It's just a plain white garment with simple embroidery along the neckline, a very homemade look. Okay, I say at last with a little skepticism and perhaps curiosity. I had decided early on that this accident was a kind of spiritual wake-up call. I would use it as an opportunity for growth and a new direction. I just wasn't expecting anyone else to know of my thoughts on the subject, not least some random stranger in my hospital room. I take the garment from her outstretched hands and lay it on my lap, and just as quickly as she enters the room, she exits. The white garment lays across my lap. My mind and heart are touched by this brief encounter, which I really don't even understand. The door swings open again. Okay, says the orderly who bursts in. Ready for that transfer? Sure, I reply. Uh, hey, do you know that lady, the one who just left my room as you came in? Nope, he says casually, focusing on the task, task at hand. Didn't see anyone. Ready? He helps me up and over the wheel to my chair, into the bed, then straightens up my legs, removes my shoes, and pulls a sheet over me. 
The mysterious white garment is hung up in the closet without a word. For many years, I never told anyone about the woman's visit or the garment she gave me. Not the nurses, not the doctor, not even a counselor who helped me during the dark times. I still have that garment. It's in my closet as I write this. And I still vividly remember that day way back in 1988. That visit from a kind stranger, a white garment so unique, and a message to accept the challenges and blessings as one. I hold that memory close to my heart. Maybe the lady was an angel or some other type of spiritual being, or maybe she was just someone with a kind nature who randomly walked into hospital rooms and handed out white shirts. I don't know. But I do agree with her that my spinal cord injury and my sudden change in life direction held blessings I could never have imagined. This brief exchange and the acceptance of the garment, as well as the accompanying message, became a touchstone for my life with spinal cord injury. Ah, yes, I love that part of your story. It is, um, you know, you. One of the things when I when I started this podcast, it was really in the beginning. It was just to be able to have my voice um, to yeah. speak because so for so many years. Uh, as like almost everybody I've, you know, held tight to not upset anybody or, you know, offend anybody, you know, uh, or be judged. And, mm -hmm. um, but as I've been going with this, I've met so many amazing people that have had horrific things happen to them in their life that on the other side of that, they see it as, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing these amazing things. It never would have occurred to me. And, and so it's just like, it has opened up this whole world to me of amazing people like you. And, um, and that, that, that part kind of brings me to tears because everybody needs that, whether they've had something horrific happen or not and and it's really cool when you share this story and it makes me feel like there's that presence for me even though I don't see this person with the shirt you know what I'm mm. saying and yeah. um so and I can't believe I'm crying about this <laughs> <laughs> people cry with, with me all the time it's okay yeah yeah but um <laughs> that story just and I'm so glad you picked that one out to read because mm. I cried when I read it when I read your book and um and there was a few other little places that um brought me to tears but it's um being able to take something that has happened to you that so many people just give up on life and to be able to be that person that takes it and makes it something amazing. And, you know, um, from what I've read in your book and everything, and from talking to you, I feel like you have led such an extraordinary life before, but especially after um, mm -hmm. all of this that happened. And do you ever... Um, and this may be a silly question. I don't know. Do you ever sit back and think, I wish this hadn't happened. Where would my life be like today? No, well, you know, I do think about it sometimes. I mean, I, I do miss climbing mountains. I do miss taking students to the, to the wilderness and all that, that I used to do. Um, but I found other ways to satisfy that. And mm -hmm. I, I have thought, I mean, I do think about it once in a while, but you know, I was really pretty bored as a PE teacher. Yeah. I was bored and I didn't know really what to do. I was not really in any significant relationships. I was playing the field. I didn't really feel like I had a purpose in my life. So I think what for me, this injury did was kind of shake the shit out of me and, <laughs> and wake me up and go, okay. I mean, and it's not like I've been awake every day since, you know, right. I right. Hurt. Yeah. I fall back asleep as all of us do. And I have to get like shaken awake again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but really kind of like it, weight it, loss, it was... you, you lose it, you get it back, you lose it, you get it. Back. <laughs> right. But I, I, I have a taste of what it's like to be awake mm -hmm. and I will continue to work on being awake. And I, I'm, I'm very um, awake to the fact that, you know, I'm now 67 years old and I have, I still have more I want to do with my life. And I can't wait. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to just like flub around and all. And I really want to take care of me so that I can be in service to others. Right. And bring and bring and bring my presence to others. Now, 
it doesn't mean I have all the answers. That I don't, that's not it. It's that I know, I know what the power of being present for others does did for me and and how I can maybe assist others in coming back to themselves. Right. See, that's that's really what I work with is when you talk about this, you know, people give up on life, it's like, well, I think it's because they've lost touch with themselves. Yeah. It's like, let's get back to that that spirit. Let's get back to that energy. Let's get back to that childlike curiosity with the world. Mm -hmm. Well, what I find um, sometimes um, is that the reason that people, um, and I'm not saying it generally all people, but just the, a few people that I have met and worked with and everything, some of them don't want to feel the here and now because they're not happy with who they are or mm -hmm. what they they think they haven't done right or you know all these different perceptions that people gather from the people around them and from their childhood mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those times those people really have a hard time i mean digging in to to look at anything about themselves and being in the present moment you know and it's um it's one of those things like um, I, I really have to work with some people to even give them, get them to give you answers that aren't on the, just on the surface. You know, they don't want to cry. They don't want to get upset. They don't want to think and feel, you know, it's like, just let me be, you know, yeah, kind right. of thing. Do, do, yeah. you, do you find that too? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the cool things about the horses is that, you know what, they are really present. Mm -hmm. And if we're faking it, the horses are like, oh, that doesn't feel very safe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and I've sort of like assumed some of this horse energy because, you know, it's like, well, you know, you can tell me you're happy and everything's great. And okay. Is it real? I mean, I don't know. Is it, but I yeah. get a sense that maybe something's not really yeah. right there. I mean, what, what would you like to be different? So anyway, yeah. 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 It. Yeah. So um, is there something in particular that um, you would like to share with everybody maybe it's something that's not in your book that's sure. something that feels like it might be just the the bridge for someone to um mm -hmm. to move somewhere in their life sure. yeah wow that's a lot <laughs> I, guess I might have to write a whole other book on that well, I, I think I book think two. One of the that I, yeah, yeah I think one of the things that I do with people is I, I I think one of my superpowers that I feel like I can help people with is I really I really help with making complex things not so scary mm -hmm. um uh you know explain I, I that think, a little bit because technically yeah. that sounds wonderful but okay um, okay well let, let, okay for one one this is a very Okay. It's a very concrete example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I was in the hospital teaching, because I worked, I eventually, as I went through my nursing program, I was hired by Craig Hospital where I did my rehab. I was hired by them uh, to run the patient and family education program, which is a big deal because mm -hmm. people with catastrophic injuries and their families have to learn a lot about themselves, their care and all that so they can be out in the world. So one of my classes was um, bowel management. And that's kind of self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. It's about how our system works to digest our food and process elimination. Well, there's something called peristaltic action that, you know, that's the, that's the wave like movement that gets things through our system. Well, after spinal cord injury, that slows way down. Okay. So does that mean so, you get, people get constipated? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And plus all the pain meds on yeah. So, you know, nurses and doctors are notorious for using big words and the patient's like, okay, they have no clue what they're saying. So what I did in my class is I brought a slinky and I brought a slinky and I, I used a slinky to demonstrate and I even gave it to patients, you know, just, this is what peristaltic action is. Also, I brought a 30 foot long rope and I said, so when you swallow something, it has to travel. And I, I would give the, I would I would give the end to someone of the rope of the rope. And okay. I would, as I said, you 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 chew it, it's going to your stomach, it's going to your small intestine, large intestine out. And pretty soon I would, I was the end. I was where it came out, the poop, the poop. <laughs> end. And I said, so what I want you to get is that this peristaltic action really slows down. Plus it's, you know, whatever you take in, it's got to go 30 feet. And it was like, wow, then they got it. So that, that's one example. Okay. That's a very concrete example. Mm -hmm. But I think another way that I work with people is helping understand this whole process of 
We take a lot of information and people read a lot of books, self-help books. They listen to podcasts, but then they don't do anything with it. Right. So there's no change. Right. So one of the things I do, another superpower is, okay, well, let's get experiential. Let's try it out. Let's, let's put one little thing, one little thing into action so that you can work on transformation. Right. Because information is all around us. Right. We don't take it in, but we take it in, but we don't do anything with it. So that would be one of one of the things I do with people is let's let's try one little thing. I work a lot with using um, the the science of well being, mm-hmm. which is you know has its roots in positive psychology and authentic happiness and all that. But there there's one little there's a couple there's many many practices in science of well being. But one of them is around um, what went well because mm-hmm. people always want to talk about oh it didn't go well I sucked I'm like okay stop. Yeah. Every day, every day, you've got to come up with what went well today and why. Yeah. It's and, a, I, and, I it's, work- and, and it's funny you say that because um, with my coaching clients, you know, when we sit down to talk and nowadays it's still on the computer, mm-hmm. we're on Zoom and, you know, we do a few deep breaths to get yeah. settled into the space and everything. And then the first question I ask them before they can say anything else is what went well this week? And then, you know, and then we make a note of it. And the funny thing to me is, well, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I don't know. I can only think of one thing. And then we keep (laughs) talking. And then suddenly say, you know, I now remember this thing happened good too. And this thing happened. And it's just people don't even sometimes recognize it in their lives because they're so focused on what went wrong. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. So it's one one little piece like that and a few other things. So yeah. So yeah, I mean, so what I do when I work with people is um, I break it down. I make it, I make the complex not so scary. You know, we we work on one little piece, one little bite size. You know, three percent thing, three percent thing you can do. You know, whatever. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. So um, why don't we? Because um, we're we're close to being at time. So um, one of the things that I would like to ask you about before we we go forward, because I, I was thinking, because I don't really know what hand cycling is. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I know what cycling is, but so what is yeah. hand cycling? So hand cycling is when I pedal with my arms. Okay. And, so um, does that, yeah. is that a different kind of bike that allows you to do well, that? Or are you bike. laying down or what is it? Well, th- there are different iterations of it. Mine, okay. I'm, 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 I'm down low. Have you, have you seen recumbent bikes? Yeah, my sister has one. Sitting and pedaling with their, with their legs. Mm-hmm. Well, basically, it's about that size. Most of the time, has three wheels because it's right. kind of hard to hold your balance. Right. And so, yeah. So it's, it, and there's, there's several different brands. And I, uh, down in Georgia, you know, there's a really great rehab center called Shepherd Center mm-hmm. in, in Atlanta, and I know they have a really strong recreation therapy department. Mm-hmm. And I would guess they have lots of good folks out in the community that are doing hand cycling. Okay. Cause I, I haven't seen it, but it, you know, um, it, 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 you know, it's kind of like, you know, how we, um, we go through life and we don't notice all kinds of things, but yeah. now that you've mentioned it, I'm going to see them on every corner, you know, that's right. <laughs> Please do, yeah. So that's pretty cool. So, Ah, This has been really amazing. I have enjoyed it and I look forward to having more conversations with you at some point. I would love to pick your brain about some other things. And when you do book two, we definitely have to talk about that. But um, before we close, um, is there like a, a, because I'm going to put all your information in the comments and everything, but is there something some place that is the best place for people to reach out to you that you want to say in case they don't see the comments. Sure. Well, I, you know, I'm totally open to conversation. Okay. Okay. And, and if people want to contact me through my email, which is Terry, T E R R Y at Dr. Terry chase.com D R Terry chase.com. You know, just, just send me a quick note. Tell me, you know, let me know that they've saw, seen you on the, podcast and we'll we'll get a conversation or two lined up just to I like to hear what's going on with people right I mean, I'm, right I'm really not a I'm not a marketer salesy kind of, I just really like to be in a relationship and and find out what's going on with folks and if there's any way I can be of service then let's check it out that's cool well I will I will share you know since we 
we, it's been a few weeks since we connected, you know, because we didn't have time that worked together for both of us until now. But since then and today, even today, I told several people about you and your journey and how inspiring it was. Um, And in the same strain as the other people I said that I've talked to that have done amazing things in their lives after having something that most people Mm -hmm. would give up with. And Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for being that person Mm -hmm. and for writing the book, which Mm -hmm. um, was very, very good and actually helped to, to, to feel, you know, a little bit at least of what it meant to be having all of this. And, and I will say really quick with that, one of the things that I just, it just popped in my mind is that, um, you know, I, I was, I was thinking when I first started reading the book, I thought um, that you were going to be telling the story without ever having those dark night of the soul kind of thing. Um, But you didn't, you were really raw about that and how many times you really wanted to give up on, on life. You wanted to give up on things. And I think that was really good in that story because it helps, it helps me and it helps other people to realize that no matter how hard things get, when you're ready to give up, you know, you can find a way to, to pull out of it. And, and that to me is exceptional. So thank you for sharing that in the story as well. So you you guys have to get the book because it is definitely, um, um, a page turner and, Mm -hmm. um, has some surprising things in there that, um, I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. And it's available on Amazon. Okay. Um, and then I'm sure you'll have the link and then it's, it's on audible too. So, and it's only a three and a half hour, uh, listen, you know, if you just want to listen to it Yeah. and I, I narrate it. So you get to oh, hear okay. my lovely voice all the way through. So, all yeah. right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Vicki. I appreciate your work well, and appreciate you bringing me in. Well, thank you. So you can reach out to Terry for uh, some, a conversation. And then if anybody wants to reach out to me, you can reach out to me um, via my, um, my email, um, the enlightened peach at gmail.com. And if you want to have a conversation with me about um, struggles that you may be having or anything like that, you know, definitely um, get in contact with me and let's have a conversation. So Thank you again, Terry, and I greatly appreciate you. You're very welcome. All right. Bye-bye.